You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature Podcast. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, Father. This morning we were hoping to ask about the difference between Eretz and Adama, which on the surface seems so close in English when we translate them, land, earth, or ground, dirt even. But the way that you and your work have shown that there are no synonyms in the Bible, that each word is chosen for a very specific reason, for a very specific context, is essential for understanding exactly how the Bible is written. So I was hoping that you could explain to us how in Ezekiel we see these words working off of each other to bring home the very specific message that Ezekiel is trying to bring to the reader. Ezekiel is the master book of the Old Testament. His work is powerfully present in Genesis and Leviticus. So let me begin as an intro with Genesis, where very early on we have these two words in Genesis 1 through 3, which means that there is an interplay, obviously, between these two words that refer to the same reality. But as I stressed always time and again, that words reflect also functionality. If you say the soul of the matter or the heart of the matter or the spirit of the matter, I mean, you have three words here. You could say, well, in this phrase, the meaning is the same. It is the same in these phrases, but not totally, because if the author decides to move during the story to something else, the author would choose the word that would allow him to do so. It's practical, you know, that's the way people do things. Now, Eretz is the common word I go myself, because I know Arabic, it makes it easier. It is in Arabic, Ard, for instance, just to tell you how it functions. When we say the basis or the foundation of a house, we call it Ardiyat. You feminize more. Ard is already feminine, but Ardiya, you create another word, which is something that is your basis where you stand on. Be it as it may, that's what earth means, Eretz. Adama is definitely different. Its importance in this matter is that it doesn't exist in Arabic. You can't have the play in Arabic between Adama and Adam. Here we go. Meaning, when you think of Adama, which is the ground made out of dust, but then in the scriptural language, directly you have a connection with Adam, and it's very clear in Genesis 2, where God formed, notice it is, he took clay, the verb yatsar in Hebrew is the verb that is used of a potter. It's majestic that He forms out of this Adama something that you call Adam, which means from the Adama. Very powerful. Let me say a few things and then I'll move to Ezekiel and show how specifically the RSV butchered that. The RSV, as I shall show you, was written in 52 and it's clearly pro-Zionist. But this Adam, Adama is very important because linguistically, Adama is the feminine of Adam or Adam is the masculine of Adama. When I use feminine, masculine, I'm talking grammatically, okay? For my English speaking here, it's it's difficult because English is a strange language. You know, you have basically it, everything is it. You femininize or masculinize only when you get to a human being. But then I'll tell the English, why is the ship and the cat feminine? They don't know how to answer. Well, anyway, in Hebrew, as in French, as in German, so it's not just Semitic languages. This is why those who speak English have to make an extra effort. You have words that are grammatically feminine and words that are grammatically masculine. In German and Greek, 
we have also a neuter and Latin. But in French and Arabic, we have only feminine and masculine. You see, I'm choosing languages, not only Semitic. It's just a universal thing. So let's remember that in Semitic languages, you have masculine and feminine. Like in Arabic, the window is feminine and the door is masculine. It doesn't mean that they do sex. That's what it means. When you use an adjective, you have to use the feminine adjective with the feminine noun. So let's go back to Adama and Adam. Technically, when you hear it, the connection between Adama and Adam is a connection of a masculine with a feminine. Let me jump to Greek. For instance, Uranos, which is the sky, the heaven, is masculine. Ye, the earth, is feminine. And you see how the masculine with the rain impregnates the feminine. I think it's part of the language. So Adam, in conjunction, with the Adama, as I showed in my book, is either the husband or the son, which means it's the son that comes out of the Adama that has to take care of his mother. But then you have the other aspect that it's the way a husband has to take care of the wife, because without it, you don't have procreation, children, and so on. Remember, the king or the deity is the husband of the city, which is feminine, and so on. So you have this interconnection, which is essential at the end of Genesis 1, because that earth with its vegetation is the basis of the food for both man and animal. And it is man as Adam that is responsible, not the animals. He has to take care of that still. And that is the point that will be picked up by Ezekiel. I mean, the point that he stresses that the Adam is a general word. In other words, whether you are Abram and descendancy that is special in the story of the Bible, or whether you are an Egyptian or a Canaanite or a Japhetite, you are Adam. Thus, Adam would be the human being. And you have it very clearly in Genesis 1, where we hear that he created him, them, male and female. So Adam is a general word. I try to use the word human being because man means also the masculine. So let's understand. I hope my hearers are not judging my presentation on the basis of English. We have to stick with the original Hebrew. Adama has a general connotation compared to earth. The earth would be the earth of someone specifically. That's why this word means also the piece of land that someone owns. But when you hear in the scriptural language, let me repeat that. Adama is connected to Adam, which means it's the earth on which an Adam lives, not an Egyptian or a Canaanite or an Israelite or a Judahite. It's man in general. Now, I'm going to attack directly the RSV, which is really a calamity. It chooses to translate throughout Ezekiel, and I checked on that, both expressions, Admat Yisrael, Admat is a form of Adama, and Eretz Yisrael, both as the land of Israel. The further calamity lies in the fact that in English, land has the connotation of specific property of someone. I know it means also earth. When you are at sea, you see land and so on. That's the original meaning. But in this expression, the land of, it is as though it is ours. And that is the calamity of RSV because it gives a connotation that is the opposite of what Ezekiel intended, that ultimately the peace of earth where God will bring back the people from activity is an Adama for every Adam. Is my reading correct? Well, at least it is corroborated at the end of Isaiah, where also the nations will share in it. It's very tricky. 
Now, going back to Ezekiel specifically and showing again how the RSV is just mixing apples and oranges and figs, it makes its own salad, which is Zionist, basically. Whether intended or not, it doesn't make any difference. Whenever you write after 48, in the West, you're prone to assume that Israel is the land of the Jews, the Jews that developed in history as such. But in Ezekiel, we have and I can count them for you, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 instances of Admat Yisrael thrown throughout the book between chapter 7 and chapter 38, and only three times Eretz Yisrael. The latter two are found in the last part of Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48 the place where the people will settle. And interestingly, at that point, you have Eretz at the beginning in chapter 40 and in 47. It's very clear that it is speaking about a specific land, which is Canaan, and thus the part that was chosen by the scriptural God to have the story of his people being played. The third time is found in chapter 27, and I want to read it because then it shows you the meaning of Eretz specifically. In Ezekiel 27 and 17, in addressing Tyre, the Lord through his prophet says, Judah and the land of Israel traded with you, Tyre. They exchange for your merchandise, wheat and so on. Notice, he said, Judah and the land of Israel, and thus the land of Israel means that geographical part of Israel in Scripture again. You remember in my book, I showed that it's the total Canaan, you know, it's made up. and so. But functionally, we're talking about a specific area of a certain people. So when you hear Ezekiel, you have to hear the following two times in the light of the first time, meaning that this earth of Israel between 40 and 48 is an earth, definitely, but the twist comes at the end where you do not have buildings in 47 and 48. Unlike Joshua, and that's why Ezekiel is a critique of what happened in the book of Joshua, where Joshua destroyed cities and then rebuilt them or built new cities. But then that was the beginning of the sad story that ended up with the total destruction of those cities that Joshua built. But in Ezekiel is an open land, and you have the 12 tribes surrounding the one city in the land which is called the Lord is there. And with these two words, the book of Ezekiel ends, which is a metaphoric city. In Revelation, the author tells us that it comes down from heaven. And in this city, let's go for Revelation, the doors are open. So Revelation combines Isaiah and Ezekiel. The doors are open day and night, which is an impossibility. Why would you have gates to leave them open? And for the healing of the nations, they enter and go out together. And thus it becomes, if you like, the Adama par excellence, where every Adam lives under the wings of the Most High. In his own way, Ezekiel imposes this on you when throughout the longer first part of his book, 1 through 39, systematically he refers to that same Eretz Israel as Admat Israel. And that is what is really impressive. Meaning that if you hear the book in sequence, then when you hit for the first time Eretz Israel in Ezekiel 27, you have already heard 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 times Admat Israel. 
And then after that, you have one, two, three, four, five, six times Eretz Israel, and then twice at the end. So Ezekiel is inviting you to always try to understand your Eretz, your by meaning any Eretz you are on or you look at as being an Adama. That's the message. Remember, we're not talking about two different things. It's like a woman is at the same time, you know, the sister of someone and the wife of someone and the daughter of someone and the mother of someone. So let's go back to functionality. I know this is very hard for English speaking people. It's the functionality. Remember what we said about able. When you hear able now in English, in French, even in Arabic, you know, Arabic is a little bit closer. Actually, they use a word that reflects the original Hebrew. But Hebel in Hebrew is precisely this passing breath. The human being is just nothing. And yet, you know, you may not touch that human being and kill. That's the prerogative of God. So names are functional. People speaking Arabic know that. All the names in Arabic are similar to the names Victor or Hope in English. Okay. They have meanings. Now, in Arabic, all the names have meaning until now. So Ezekiel is inviting you with a good amount of pressure because his main word is that the earth is an Adama and not the Adama is an earth. He is forcing you to remember to refer to the earth on which you live as an Adama by doing so, he's forcing you to link it to any Adam. And thus, anyone who steps in is another Adam the way you are Adam. You're not special. And one can see the importance of all that in the actual situation in the woods about the people who come from war-torn places and need to live someone else. It's a judgment on how you're going to deal with them as outsiders, strangers, and thus enemies. That's what it means practically. And this is very important in the Bible because God three times says clearly in his prophets that I'm going to become the enemy of my own people. Tough. So I would say that this is the message of Ezekiel through his use of these two words. Now, when you go and reread Ezekiel totally, you will realize that this is practically his message. Let me give you one example. One is enough in 37, when he reforms again his flock, his people. You hear that from the dry bones, he raises them, and then he puts on them skin and sinews. It's amazing. This reminds you of what of Genesis 2, where Adam is made of the Adama. It's not that these people are special. They are made in the same way as the Adam, the human being, is made. And this is underscored, and I would like my hearer to hear this, because especially the Orthodox, they jump on any text that speaks about the resurrection. We are so self-centered, the Orthodox. But in 37, you have the first part speaking about this raising of the new people. And immediately, it's in one stretch, you have the reference of God making out of two staffs, two stocks, Judah and Israel, one people. You could hear the punch that Judah shall not be saved on its own. That's why when the Judahites, it's very funny, just listen to it. When the Judahites are saved from their deportation, they become Israel. It's like telling the Canadians, the fullness of you Canadians is that you become Mexico or the USA or Venezuela. I mean, (laughs) it's a slap in the face. Okay, just hear it. And it's entered in all our jargon. Take, for instance, the state of Israel today. Israel, where do you have the Jews? But people forget that in the Bible, you have two entities. 
let's go to Ezekiel, to stay in Ezekiel. When you hear this in 37, where again, towards the end of the book, you have heard already before in Ezekiel 27, Judah and the land of Israel. So the author is aware he's the same author as the books of kings and so on, where you have two entities, two political entities that sometimes fight against one another. So Judah is not Israel and Israel is not Judah, but the totality is one. And the author on purpose chooses the lesser word. You know how the kingdom of Israel disappears very early with Samaria and the torch is carried by the kingdom of Judah. That's why when you hear about the exile, most of the people think about the Babylonian exile. Few people remember the Assyrian exile. But Ezekiel goes back and brings the two together under the torch of Israel, the previous to Judah. So what I said about Adama and Eretz is backed up, is corroborated by the rest of the message of Ezekiel. And this is how one has to train oneself to listen to literature. One cannot impose on it. That's the painful story of all of us. We hear in the beginning, God created, and suddenly everybody at the age of four starts speaking about God as though we know what we're talking about. God is God is God is God is God. But that's the trick. It's the God which is in your mind. What is this God that is in the text? Is the God of which the text speaks. Well, first of all, the slap in our face is that in Genesis 1.1, this God is expressed through a plural word, Elohim, which means technically gods. And the proof thereof is that so very often later, Elohim, you're forced from the context to translate as gods. Now, I don't want to debate that unless Father Mark chooses this as a topic for next time. I mean, <laughs> my point for the time being is that this word that appears in Genesis 1-1, you have to wait until you've read at least a good part of Scripture to understand what the author is saying and not say, ah, God. That's what people say. You see, Father Paul, ah, there it is. But that's how we do things. All of us, especially again the Orthodox, can speak for 27 hours on John 1.1. 1, 1. But when you force them to hear the tape, they will realize that throughout they have been quoting passages from the Gospel of John, meaning that you cannot speak about John 1.1 1, 1 unless you have heard the entire book. But instead of allowing ourselves to be shaped by the 21 chapters of John. We shape them intellectually, and this is what Alexandrian theology did. It brought Greek philosophy, the philosophy of Plato, and forced it into the original text, and that is the calamity of calamities. So Eretz Israel and Admat Israel are two different connotations, and to put them under one word, the land of Israel, and I explain to you that already the land is tricky, because this is the meaning it has nowadays, that one loses what Ezekiel is saying. But then when you quote it in meetings, already you're forcing the people to bow down to your interpretation. That is why in my book I stressed at the end that the only it of total value is the it of the text as it stands in this special language that the authors made up. That is why ultimately one is to submit to the text. And here I cannot but refer to that third branch of monotheism, Islam, which took that word. And let me say a few words about this word, that it is the same root for peace. Very interesting, sound very Pauline, that to get the ultimate peace, one has to submit to one other, specifically we to that God of peace. The God of peace in the Bible remains God. He doesn't 
become your pop or your old man, as we say in the United States. No, he remains the one to whom you have to submit. Aslama is the translation of Ipakui, Ipakuo, of Paul in Romans to submit. Again, I spread it a little bit to show to my hearers really the effort they will have to put. The only valid it is the scriptural text to which we submit. And I cannot but repeat what I said so many times. This is reflected in the rubrics of the Orthodox Church and other churches, but specifically Orthodox Church, where the book, in whatever form, whether four Gospels or the entire Bible, doesn't matter. You have a book with which you bless everything, including the icons. And I'm underscoring that for the Orthodox, that think that the icons are more important than the book and the cross. You can't find the book and the cross in their houses, but you find lots of icons. With the book, you bless everything. Our sacramental liturgies all begin with blessed is the kingdom, with the celebrant holding the book. It is the it that blesses everything else and does not need any blessing. It is the blessing. But as we hear from Deuteronomy, it can be also the curse. That is our deal here, and I hope I made that point clear. I went through a few asides. This comes from my interest always to invite the hearer to understand the totality of the message. So it's not by choosing Adma, Adama, and so on. You have to show that it parallels the rest of the message of Ezekiel. The distinction you're making between Eretz and Adama, I'm wondering if I'm understanding correctly, because with Adama as the original creation in Genesis, and then Eretz belonging to this group or that group. What you said about Joshua also sparked something in me, and I want to see if I'm understanding correctly. Is there a link between the city and building the city and the Adama becoming an Eretz in the bad sense of the word Eretz? Or is the city and the Eretz linked somehow? Uh, Yes and no. (laughs) The Eretz can go either way. Because the Eretz remains an Adama. If you reread my commentary on Genesis and my book, you will see that on purpose, the author uses these two words very early. So it is intentional. It's the function. Now, to be fair to what you said, technically, Adama controls you, whereas Eretz is open up to the building of a city. In other words, your statement is correct so long as one remembers that you cannot impose the city on the understanding of Eretz. When the Adama slash Eretz develop into a city civilization, it is as though it links itself to the connotation of Eretz as a possession. It's not the original Eretz. Let's go to Arabic when we use the Ardiyat, which is foundation from the root Arad, which is the basis which is underneath you. Already, it's something general. God created the heavens and the earth. It is general. So I have to say yes and no, because I'm afraid if I would say yes, then your hearer and possibly you are imposing a certain understanding of the original Eretz. But from the language, you could see that it becomes the possession of someone. Take the story of Ahab and Naboth. He had a vineyard, his own piece of land, you know. It's an Eretz, but it's also an Adama that gives life. And And the whole discussion is about the possession. At that point in the text, you're going to find definitely more Eretz. Arabic, which I use in my book, that example. Until now, you know, again, we don't have the word Adam in Arabic. We have insan from Enosh. But in the language, seeped the use of the adjective Adami, Adamite, as meaning a humane, a good human being. Until now, we use it in Arabic. 
And I use that example because it parallels my answer to you. It is the usage that tells you Adam is more general. Adami, in spoken Arabic, Adami. In other words, behave towards the others around you as though you are all from the same piece of clay. <laughs> and you separate yourself when you say you and the people around you are Adamiyun, Adamites, where the others are. I can use so many bad words in Arabic, you know, are different outsiders. That would be my answer to your question. In your commentary on Genesis, when you made the case that God had offered Adam a companion from one of the many different mammals, so to speak, but somehow Adam didn't want to be like all of the other things from the ground. He thought himself something different or better. I remember thinking how it cuts through all the nonsense about gender in modern discourse about Genesis, because the real chauvinism is not men versus women. The real chauvinism is man versus not only his neighbor, but versus creation, versus the other living things that creep and crawl upon the earth. It's right there in the language. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it always stuns me how we always use Genesis 2 and 3, the end of 2, especially to speak about the marriage and the conjoining, and she's part of the man. But this is a slap in the face of man that he wanted to join himself to something that comes out of himself. It's a reflection, notice, and she was called Isha, which is the feminine of Ish. He's separating the Adam that was conjoined in Genesis 1. He created him, them, male and female. It's powerful, but it's negative. That's why people don't like the way I handle it. The only exception where one should go back and forth and take a light from here to enlighten the other one is to read Genesis in function of Ephesians chapter 5. And the author is very smart there, where he shows that the boss has to take care by serving as a slave to wash. In the Roman Empire, it's the slaves that wash the masters. Come on now, friends. Don't you watch TV, movies, do something besides reading scripture. If only people knew, Father Paul. Well, that's, Every that's time... the trouble. That's <laughs> what I said. To <laughs> understand Paul, one has to remember he was a little bit more Roman at heart than he was a Jew, because for him, the real Jew is to be Israelite, and he was an Israelite. Anyway, you're tickling me, Father Mark. I can't help myself. As it's a good Richard morning, Father Paul. A little while ago. <laughs> Father, thanks so thank much you. for your time. Dr. Benton, thank you. Gentlemen, have a great okay, day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.